I think they basically thought we were naive greenies from the city. I'm sure they thought that we had come here with all these ideas and within a year or two we'd find it was all just too hard and it wasn't happening and we'd go again. Here we are 31 years later. And it's interesting because I don't think there's a single farmer around us who may not be completely believing what we're doing, but there, I don't think there's a single farmer who's not backing Hinawai now. I think it was in about October 1987, we wrote an article for the local newspaper, which is called the Akaroa Mail. I just thought we'd let the community know what we were doing here. It was interesting because we wrote this article and then a, a few weeks later we got this amazing response from one of the farmers. Um, I can read you that article if you like. So, um, uh, well, I, I, it was a much longer article than this, but I said in the article, my secret dream is that one day a whole catchment from summit crest to sea, from snow tussock to nikol palm, from Salmesia to mamaku tree fern and yellow-eyed penguins could be set aside for nature to reassert her original covering. That's what I said in the article. And then um, this was a response from one of the farmers. Again, I'm only reading the last two paragraphs. This is a farmer who lived in the next valley on a gorse-infested farm which he had been trying to fight all his life. And he said, I am all for saving patches of bush, but the thought of starting from scratch on land that is clear enough to be used productively frankly appalls me. As for shutting up a whole valley, heaven help us from fools and dreamers. I love that. I regard that as a, as a great compliment because we need a few more fools and dreamers in the world, I think. So here we are on Hanawai Reserve. We're in the southeast corner of Banks Peninsula, which is on the east coast of the South Island, jutting out into the, into the Pacific. The amazing thing about New Zealand, I think, is how recently people got here. Uh, across the Tasman Sea, 60,000 years ago, when the Aboriginal people reached Australia, but only about 800 years ago, until amazing Polynesian voyages finally hit the biggest landmass in Polynesia and settled here. The first named group we know of is called Waitaha. Another wave of settlement came for, called Ngati Mamoi from the North Island. And then in about 1700, uh, the Ngaitahu or Kaitahu came southwards from the North Island again. Then of course Pakeha came, Pakeha, the European settlers from the other side of the planet. They arrived here. All these waves of human settlement had a huge impact ecologically, as you can imagine. At the beginning, Banks Peninsula was forested from side to side and from top to bottom, an ancient old growth forest. Both Māori and European settlement had a huge impact on the forest. So by 1900, less than 1% of the old growth forest was left. So Hinawai Reserve, uh, it's a result of the Morris White Native Forest Trust. We look after 1,500 hectares. It's quite a big area, several catchments. 
The whole idea was to make it possible for nature to speed up the regeneration of the native forest and restore the native biodiversity as much as is possible because we've lost some things altogether. Conservation was our first goal, to restore the biodiversity on which we're all completely dependent. We sometimes forget that. Some people say, well, why are you restoring the forest? In a way, saying why are you doing it is like saying, why should you love your mother? That's what a, a sort of parallel. We're totally, totally dependent on vegetation and the wildlife it supports for our own lives. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for plants and vegetation and animals and birds and so on. So our prime goal is conservation, but from the very beginning, we decided that people would be able to come here freely and whenever they wanted, without asking, could just come and walk our tracks. And there's many, many kilometres of walking tracks now. So it's really like a little mini national park right on the doorstep of Akaroa itself. So there's two centres of settlement, if you like. The house we're in now is my post-earthquake house. Previously, I lived in an older house just about 100 metres away across to the east, and that was somewhat damaged in the big earthquakes of 2010 and 2011. Andrew, who's been a trustee, came to work here with us several years ago, and he lives during the week in my old earthquake-damaged house and goes home to his wife, Suzanne, in the weekends. And then Otanarito Homestead, Paul and Tricia live down there, and it's about one hour's walk away. Beneath is on the power pole up there, oh. and there's a few of them, but I can't work out how many. This is Hinawai Stream, the first crossing. This is permanent flow here. Even in the driest of drought years, we've never lost our flow in the larger streams. And it's amazing when you think of it, because uh, a lot of people think of Banks Peninsula being a sort of an open, dry, grassy place, but this is really what Banks Peninsula is and was. And the water is uh, a very prominent part of it. We just keep finding new waterfalls as we explore more. This is one of the first ones we found. It's right on the main track, so everybody sees this. We put a little one-minute track off to it. It's called Fuchsia Falls. It's only one of about 47 waterfalls across the whole of Hinawai that we've found so far and named. You can't meet Hugh and not just like him. Hugh's the boss and he's the day-to-day -day manager of the reserve. He gets up every day, he has the same routine and he goes to work. And work is hard. We don't use vehicles to get to work, so the work site might be two hours walk away. And so two hours after walking to work, you start work and you work all day and then you walk home for two hours. And when he gets home, he, uh, he'll have, have his bath and have his dinner. And from about 7 o'clock or 7.30, he's ready for his evening. And so he sits at his table and he starts working. And he does all the paperwork involved with Hanawai. He writes letters, he writes submissions, he writes and he writes and he writes. Then the next day he gets up and off he goes again. He's amazing, it's his life, it's his dream.
hooked up there, it gets too difficult. Ha! <laughs> 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 From a very, very early age, I was walking on Banks Peninsula. I remember getting very interested in bird life, and I thought, oh, I'll grow Banks Peninsula plants in the back garden of our family home. And I just got so fascinated by the way plants grew. Just everything about plants just completely caught my fancy. was interesting at university because I had decided from the very beginning to do both arts and science. And it was botany I went on with, really. So for several years I'd been tramping on a regular systematic grid pattern of sampling across Banks Peninsula, doing in much greater detail than had ever been done before a detailed botanical look at the peninsula. And then as I was doing this, I was thinking, Gosh, I know I thought it had been completely trashed, but there's so much still here, a lot of it coming back. So all this made me think, I'd love to look after a bit of this land and let this all happen. And amazingly, I was introduced to this guy called Morris White. He'd set up a fund to purchase land for conservation purposes on Banks Peninsula. He said, well, would you be interested in being involved? And I think I waited about half a nanosecond and said, yes. <laughs> we started looking for land and I kept my eyes sharp open. And on this particular bit of land, which was the original part of Hinawai, 109 hectares, I said to Morris, look, this is ideal. It's, um, it's a reasonable size, but not huge. It's got old growth forest on it, so we can see what the end result would be of a regeneration program. And it's basically uneconomic in marginal hill country, which really shouldn't really be farmed at all. September 1987, we bought that land. Four years later, it became hugely bigger because we had the opportunity to buy an alternative station, which was right next to us, and that made it 10 times bigger. The local community was a bit suspicious about what we were doing, I have to say. All the farmers in the area thought he was a total nutter. When I first heard of the fact that Shu and the Trust were going to use Gorse to help regenerate the natives, um, I was a, a, a sceptic of it. They went, no, he's going to let Gorse grow. You can't let Gorse grow. I come from a rural background. Gorse is a weed. You get rid of Gorse. You burn it, you poison it, you bulldoze it, but you get rid of gorse. Gorse is a terrible, terrible weed for pastoral farming. It's shocking. And, and no one, let alone me, would deny that. But it's also, almost nothing is black and white, is it? If you've got it and it's sort of infested the landscape irretrievably, in a way, it's worth looking at its good points and seeing, well, maybe we don't have to fight it. On this marginal hill country, fighting it usually makes it worse because that's what gorse thrives on. So we said, no, we're just going to leave the gorse alone on this gorse-infested pasture. We don't want pasture, we want native forest to regenerate, and gorse is a wonderful nurse canopy for native forest regeneration. It's an opportunistic plant. It takes advantage of cleared ground and forest climates, but it can't stand uh, shade. It has to have full sunlight. So as soon as it's shaded, it's dead. So it grows quite fast in the full light, but then other things come in underneath it, naturally. Shade-tolerant hardwood trees, for example, and they just thrive under the gorse shelter. The gorse is a nitrogen fixer, so it's actually fertilising the soil all the time, with nitrates a very important a nutrient for plant life. This is old man gorse here with a few natives. Often it's thicker than this, sometimes it's thinner than this, but eventually all these natives come up under here. The one that's probably the most abundant one of all is mahoi or whitey wood, which we can see here. It, it thrives under the shade, but once it gets its head up, it loves the sun as well. So as soon as the head's up above the, the, into the light, it's shading the gorse and the gorse dies. As all these lower parts of the gorse is all dead because it's shaded. 
I initially thought that the progression from gorse to native trees would take 50 years, but in 10 years you could see it. You could see them coming up through the gorse in areas that I didn't, I didn't realise there would be natives growing. And now, of course, you're not getting pasture back, but you're getting native forest back with all its benefits. Increased benefits now with carbon sequestration as well as all the ecological and biodiversity values that are being fostered this way. Our whole philosophy is what I call minimal interference management. People have an inflated opinion of what Homo sapiens is capable of. I hate to say this because I'm a Homo sapiens as well. <laughs> but um, we're really good at damaging things. We're not all that good at putting things right. But all the serious work of natural regeneration of native forest and wildlife has been done by nature. People say to us, oh, you're planting all this forest back. And, and it's a sensible sounding question. But really, if we were planting this forest back, we'd never do it on 1,500 hectares of land, of wild, hilly, rough terrain. We'd never do it. Nature has planted the forest back in totally ecologically appropriate and scientifically interesting ways. There's millions of hectares of productive farmland in New Zealand on good soils or on easy terrain. But then there's also, let's say, millions of hectares also in marginal hill country that are not actually that productive, but with our farming ethic, we sort of think it's clear to forest we should keep farming it and producing food. And of course we need to produce food. We all have to eat. So we're all dependent on the farms producing food. Perhaps we could be a bit more sensible, maybe eat a little bit less meat and make it more efficient and environmentally friendly. But my idea, even New Zealand wide, and particularly with the possibility of income now from this land is carbon sequestration. You stop trying to farm that land. You don't even plant exotic forests on it. For timber maybe, but certainly not for carbon sequestration. That's just replacing one ridiculous folly with another ridiculous folly. The scene is wide open for taking this marginal gorse infested hill country and letting it just do what Hinawa is doing on a much grander scale and regenerating into native forest on its own. We don't have to plant this stuff. Nature's doing it. All we've got to do is take away the deleterious things that are stopping it happening fast. As well as sequestering carbon, you get all the other benefits. You get the huge biodiversity on which we're totally dependent as well. And we also share the world with all the other species that have evolved as well. That's a, a crucial thing we tend to forget about. Everything's done very slow here. Um, people walk. Paul and I will use a vehicle, but Hugh doesn't use a vehicle. He'll cycle or, or he'll walk. So he doesn't believe we should be using fossil fuels. And instead of saying, don't use fossil fuels, he just rides his bike. And he'll use public transport. I'm a technological person like anyone in the modern world. I, I have a house with electricity. My hot water is heated by the sun, by solar panels on the roof, but I don't have photovoltaic cells to create electricity here. And we are on a national grid here. So that's a quite a big technological thing. I have a landline telephone. I don't have a cell phone. It wouldn't be pointless anyway because we're out of cell phone range here, thank goodness, thank heavens. <laughs> 
I'm not against all this technology. I'm not anti it, but I don't want it. I'm very happy with, um, with the level of technology I have here. I do see, unfortunately, that uncritical acceptance of a lot of this technology. We're losing a lot of our old schools and artistic and creative satisfaction. I, I really do feel that quite strongly. So I'm not in a sort of mood to just roll with the tide and take on all this technology, which I think is unnecessary for me and actually not all that good for the community, to be honest. It has wonderful advantages as well. And some of the things that technology produces, I, I, I'd be the first to praise. I mean, the bicycle, for example, I regard as the peak of transport technology. And it's technology, and I love it. And I love my work here, and I meet innumerable people here. I, I'm not a hermit. I do interact with the rest of humanity, for sure. <laughs> and love it. My roots are here. Uh, I immense satisfaction from seeing what is happening here. Fire has always been our biggest fear, I'd say. In 2011, we had a major lightning strike here. So that morning was terrible. Um, we, we actually saw the, the thunderstorm come over. It was an almost a rainless thunderstorm in, in July. It was the driest winter we've ever recorded. Um, so the conditions were like, some are like dry conditions here. And then this electrical storm came over. We saw the lightning strike come down and it hit um, Full Moon Bluff across here on the high ridge. And it just exploded into flame. We got, had an immediate response. There was, I think, seven helicopters. And the helicopters could barely fly that first day because of the wind. So it largely just kept burning. Firefighters said, look, we just don't know what it's going to do overnight. So I packed up what I could. It was at one of the worst moments of my life and, and was evacuated to Akaroa, jumped on my bike and rode to Akaroa. In the morning, I woke up there, looked up, and the whole of Tarterehu, Stony Bay Peak, was just ringed with fire. And by that time, the wind had died down, and then the helicopters could fly. And they took monsoon bucket after monsoon bucket out of Pūtakitaki Pond. But the interesting thing was, every time it was burning fast through gorse, every time it hit a bush edge, a regenerated native bush edge, or even beech forest, older growth forest, just went out. So there was almost no native bush destroyed. Huge areas of gorse with natives coming through, but was still largely gorse, that was burning hot and fast. So it burnt, I think, for 27 hours. But it was very emotional for me. I came back the next morning to my house, found it still here. Fire was out. This, the whole landscape in front of me was just blackened. It was just a complete nightmare. <laughs> yeah. I can still feel that emotion just almost leaping on me like a, like a, like a panther. Mm. I think the, the community now, by and large, is 
absolutely in support of Hinawai. We realised that the way farming was done over the years had to be changed. And I think from what Hugh has done has helped people realise that um, it can be done in a, in a good way. I think it's a really interesting time to be involved in conservation. There's this great groundswell now of, of people who are closing off whole gullies because it's uneconomical land, so they're letting the bush grow back um, and they're fencing it off so that nature can be there, so that we can have these corridors and so that the birds can move and the insects can move and things can, can get from the summit to the sea and, and over the hills to the next one. Forestry alone won't save us from global warming because uh, a lot of the sequestered carbon um, is locked up in fossil fuels. But even covering every inch of dry land in the world with forests wouldn't sequester enough if we keep on burning the fossil fuels that have been sequestered for millions of years. So forestry is definitely part of the solution, but not the whole part. We have to change our, the way we, we use energy as well. In a big way, we have to do it really quickly or we're, we're really stuffed. No one person can solve these massive problems. So all you can do and all, any, all the universe can expect of you is to do your best. Your best can be on all sorts of different scales. We're doing our best here in terms of human life and the, the ecology and biodiversity and climate and other species sharing the planet with us, all those things. Plant for the birds, plant for the bees throw a few flowers in your garden. It doesn't have to be as big as Hinawai. So if people can look at Hinawai and say, gosh, this is succeeding in lovely ways, I'll do something in my own little corner of the world that draws some sort of inspiration from there. I'd, I'd be delighted with that. It's never been our intention. Our intention was just to do the right thing in this corner of the world. But if that's repeated, over and over and over again, well, the, the possibilities are immense. The problems are immense, but the solutions are immense too.